Hello, children. Uncle Charles here with another Dread Time story for you. Are we all tucked up comfortably, feet up and under the covers away from whatever lurks beneath the bed? Excellent. Then we'll begin. And tonight's tale is entitled The Company of Wolves by Angela Carter. One beast and only one howls in the woods by night. The wolf is a carnivore incarnate, and he's as cunning as he is ferocious. Once he's had a taste of flesh, then nothing else will do. At night, the eyes of wolves shine like candle flames, yellowish, reddish, but that is because the pupils of their eyes fatten on darkness and catch the light from your lantern to flash it back at you, red for danger. If a wolf's eyes reflect only moonlight, then they gleam a cold and unnatural green, a mineral, a piercing colour. If the benighted traveller spires those luminous, terrible sequins stitch suddenly on the black thickets, then he knows he must run, if fear has not struck him stock still. But those eyes are all you will be able to glimpse of the forest assassins as they cluster invisibly around your smell of meat as you go through the wood unwisely late. They will be like shadows. They will be like wraiths, grey members of a congregation of nightmare. Hark! His long wavering howl, an aria of fear made audible. The wolf song is the sound of the rending you will suffer, in itself a murdering. It is winter and cold weather. In this region of mountain and forest there is now nothing but for the wolves to eat. Goats and sheep are locked up in the byre. The deer departed for the remaining pasturage on the southern slopes. Wolves grow lean and famished. There is so little flesh on them that you could count the starving, the starveling ribs through their pelts if they gave you time before they pounced. Those slathering jaws, the lolling tongue, the rhyme of saliva on the grizzled chops, all of the teeming perils of the night and the forest, ghosts, hobgoblins, ogres that grill babies upon gridirons, witches that fatten their captives in cages for cannibal tables. The wolf is worst for he cannot listen to reason. You are always in danger in the forest where no people are. Step between the portals of the great pines where the shaggy branches tangle about you, trapping the unwary traveller in nets as if the vegetation itself were in a plot with the wolves who live there, as though the wicked trees go fishing on behalf of their friends. Step between the gateposts of the forest with the greatest trepidation and infinite precautions, for if you stray from the path for one instant, the wolves will eat you. They are grey as famine, they are as unkind as plague. The grave-eyed children of the sparse villages always carry knives with them, and they go out to tend the little flocks of goats that provide the homesteads with acrid milk and rank maggoty cheeses. Their knives are half as big as they are, the blades are sharpened daily. But the wolves have ways of arriving at your hearthside. We try and try, but sometimes we cannot keep them out. There is no winter's night the cottage does not fear to see a lean, grey, famished snout questing under the door. And there was a woman once bitten in her own kitchen as she was straining the macaroni. Fear and flee the wolf. Worst of all, the wolf may be more than he seems. There was a hunter once, near here, that trapped a wolf in a pit. The wolf had massacred the sheep and goats, eaten up a mad old man who used to live by himself in a hut halfway up the mountain and sing to Jesus all day, pounced on a girl looking after the sheep, but she made such a commotion that men came with rifles and scared him away and tried to track him down, down into the forest, but he was cunning and easily gave them the slip. So this hunter dug a pit and put a duck in it for bait. All alive, oh. And he covered the pit with straw smeared with wolf dung. Quack, quack, went the duck. And a wolf came slinking out of the forest, a big one, a heavy one. He weighed as much as a grown man, and the straw gave way beneath him. Into the pit he tumbled. The hunter jumped down after him, slit his throat, cut off all his paws for a trophy. And then no wolf at all lay in front of the hunter but the bloody trunk of a man, headless, footless, dying, 
dead. A witch from up the valley once turned an entire wedding party into wolves because the groom had settled on another girl. She used to order them to visit her at night from spite and they would sit and howl around her cottage for her, serenading her with their misery. Not so long ago, a young woman in the valley village married a man who vanished clean away on her wedding night. The bed was made with new sheets, and the bride laid down in it, the groom said. He was going out to relieve himself, insisted on it for the sake of decency, and she drew the coverlet up to her chin, and she lay there, and she waited, and she waited, and then she waited again. Surely he's been gone a long time until she jumps up in bed and shrieks to hear a howling coming on the wind from the forest. That long-drawn, wavering howl has, for all its fearful resonance, some inherent sadness in it. As if the beasts would love to be less beastly, if only they knew how, and never cease to mourn their own condition. There is a vast melancholy in the canticles of the wolves, Melancholy infinite of the forest, endless as these long nights of winter, and yet that ghastly sadness, that mourning for their own irremediable appetites, can never move the heart, for not one phase in it hints at the possibility of redemption. Grace could not come to the wolf from its own despair, only through some external mediator so that sometimes the beast will look as if he half welcomes the knife that dispatches him. The young woman's brothers searched the outhouses and the haystacks, but never found any remains, so the sensible girl dried her eyes and found herself another husband, not too shy to piss into a pot who spends the nights indoors. She gave him a pair of bonny babies, and all went right as a, as a trivet, until... One freezing night, the night of the solstice, the hinge of the year when things do not fit together as well as they should. The longest night, her first good man came home again. A great thump on the door announced him as she was stirring the soup for the father of her children, and she knew him the moment she lifted the latch to him, although it was years since she'd worn black for him. And now he was in rags, and his hair hung down his back, and never saw a comb alive with lice. Here I am again, missus, he said. Give me my bowl of cabbage and be quick about it. Then her second husband came in with wood for the fire, and when he saw the first one, saw she'd slept with another man, and worse, clapped his red eyes on her little children who crept into the kitchen to see what all the din was about, he shouted, I wish I were a wolf again to teach this whore a lesson. So a wolf he instantly became and tore off the eldest boy's left foot before he was chopped up with a hatchet they used for chopping logs. But when the wolf lay bleeding and gasping its last, the pelt melted off again, and he was just as he had been years ago when he ran away from his marriage bed so that she wept and her second husband beat her. They say there's an ointment the devil gives you that turns you into a wolf the minute you rub it on, or that he was born feet first and had a wolf for a father for his torso, and his torso, its torso is a man's, but its legs and genitals are wolf's, and he has a wolf's heart. Seven years is a werewolf's natural span, but if you burn his human clothing, you condemn him to wolfliness for the rest of his life. So old wives hereabouts think it some protection to throw a hat or an apron at the werewolf as as if clothes made the man yet by the eyes those phosphorescent eyes you know him in all his shapes the eyes alone unchanged by metamorphosis before he can become a wolf the lycanthrope strips stark naked if you spy a naked man among the pines you must run as if the devil were after you it is midwinter, and the robin, the friend of man, sits on the handle of the gardener's spade and sings. It is the worst time in all the year for wolves, but this strong-minded child insists she will go out through the woods. She is quite sure the wild beasts cannot harm her, although, well warned, she lays a carving knife in the basket her mother has packed with cheeses. There is a bottle of harsh liquor distilled from brambles, a batch of flat oat cakes baked on the hearthstone, a pot or two of jam, 
the flaxen-haired girl will take these delicious gifts to a recl reclusive grandmother so old the burden of her years is crushing her to death. Granny lives two hours trudge through the winter woods. The child wraps herself up in her thick shawl, drawn it over her head. She steps into her stout wooden shoes. She is dressed and ready, and it is Christmas Eve. The malign door of the solstice still swings upon its hinges, but she has been too much loved ever to feel scared. Children do not stay young for long in this savage country. There are no toys for them to play with. So they work hard and grow wise, but this one, so pretty, and the youngest of her family, a little latecomer, had been indulged by her mother and her grandmother, who knitted her the red shawl that today has the ominous, if brilliant, look of blood on snow. Her breasts have just begun to swell. Her hair is like lint, so fair it hardly makes a shadow on her pale forehead. Her cheeks are as emblematic, scarlet and white, and she has just started her woman's bleeding a clock inside her that will strike henceforth forward once a month. She stands and moves within the invisible pentacle of her own virginity. She is an unbroken egg. She is a sealed vessel. She has inside her a magic space, the entrance to which is shut tight with a plug of membrane. She is a closed system. She does not know how to shiver. She has her knife, and she is afraid of nothing. Her father might forbid her if he was home, but he is away in the forest gathering wood, and her mother cannot deny her. The forest closed upon her like a pair of jaws. There is always something to look at in the forest. Even in the middle of winter, the huddled mounds of birds succumbing to the lethargy of the season. Heaped on the creaking boughs, and too forlorn to sing, the bright frills of the winter fungi on the blotched trunks of the trees, the cuneiform slots of rabbits and, de and deer, the herringbone tracks of the birds, the hair as lean as a rasher of bacon streaking across the path where the thin sunlight dapples the russet breaks of last year's bracken. When she heard the freezing howl of a distant wolf, her practised hand sprang to the hand handle of her knife, but she saw no sign of a wolf at all, nor of a naked man, neither. But then she heard a clattering among the brushwood, and there sprang onto the path a fully clothed one, a very handsome young one, in the green coat and wide awake hat of a hunter, laden with carcasses of game birds. She had her hand on her knife at the first rustle of twigs, but he laughed with a flash of white teeth when he saw her, and made her a, a comic yet flattering little bow. She'd never seen such a fine fellow before, not among the rustic clowns of her native village, so on they went together through the thickening light of the afternoon. Soon they were laughing and joking like old friends. When he offered to carry her basket, she gave it to him, although her knife was in it, because he told her his rifle would protect them. As the day darkened, it began to snow again. She felt the first flakes settle on her eyelashes, but now there was only half a mile to go, and there would be a fire, and hot tea, and a welcome, and a warm one, surely for the dashing huntsman as well as for herself. The young man had a remarkable object in his pocket. It was a compass. She looked at the little round glass face in the palm of his hand and watched the wavering needle with a vague wonder. He assured her this compass had taken him safely through the wood on his hunting trip because the needle always told him with perfect accuracy where the north was. She did not believe it. She knew she should never leave the path on the way through the wood or else she would be lost instantly. He laughed at her again. Gleaming trails of spittle clung to his teeth. He said if he plunged off the path into the forest that surrounding them, he could guarantee to arrive at her grandmother's house a good quarter of an hour before she did, plotting his way through the undergrowth with his compass, while she trudged the long way along the winding path. I don't believe you. Besides, aren't you afraid of the wolves? He only tapped the gleaming butt of his rifle and grinned. Is it a bet? he asked her. Shall we make a game of it? What will you give me if I give you if I get you to your grandmother's house before you? What would you like? she asked disingenuously. A kiss. Commonplaces of a rustic seduction, she lowered her eyes and blushed. He went through the undergrowth and took her basket with him. But she forgot to be afraid of the beasts, although now the moon was rising for well, she wanted to dawdle on her way to make sure the handsome gentleman would win his wager. 
Grandmother's house stood by itself a little way out of the village. The freshly falling snow blew in eddies about the kitchen garden, and the young man stepped delicately up the snowy path to the door, as if he were reluctant to get his feet wet, swinging the bundle of game and the girl's basket and humming a little tune to himself. There is a trace of blood on his chin. He has been snacking on his catch. He rapped upon the panels with his knuckles. Aged and frail, Granny has three quarters succumbed to the mortality the ache in her bones promises her, and almost ready to give in entirely. A boy came out from the village to build up her hearth for the night an hour ago, and the kitchen crackles with busy firelight. She has her Bible for company. She is a pious old woman. She is propped up on several pillows in the bed set into the wall peasant fashion, wrapped up in patchwork quilt she made before she was married more years ago than she cares to remember. Two China Spaniels with liver-coloured blotches on their coats and black noses sit on either side of the fireplace. There is a bright rug of woven rags on the pantiles. The grandfather clock ticks away her eroding time. We keep the wolves outside by living well. He rapped upon the panels with his hairy knuckles. It is your granddaughter, he mimicked in a high soprano. Lift up the latch and walk in, my darling. You can tell them by their eyes. Eyes of a beast of prey. Nocturnal, devastating eyes as red as a wound. You can hurl your Bible at him and your apron after, Granny. You'd thought that was a sure prophylactic against those infernal vermin. Now call on Christ and his mother and all the angels in heaven to protect you. But it won't do you any good. His feral muzzle is, is sharp as a knife. He drops his golden bundle of gnawed pheasant on the table and puts down your dear girl's basket too. Oh my God, what have you done with her? Off with his disguise. That coat of forest coloured cloth. The hat with the feather tucked into the ribbon. His matted hair streams down his white shirt and she can see the lice moving in it. The sticks in the hearth shift and hiss. Night and the forest has come to the kitchen with darkness tangled in its hair. He strips off his shirt. His skin is the colour and texture of vellum. A crisp stripe of hair runs down his belly. His nipples are ripe and dark as poison fruit. But he's so thin you could count the ribs under his skin if only he gave you the time. He strips off his trousers and she can see how hairy his legs are. His genitals huge. Ah, huge. The last thing the old lady saw in all this world was a young man, eyes like cinders, naked as a stone, approaching her bed. The wolf is carnivore incarnate. When he had finished with her, he licked his chops and quickly dressed himself again until he was just as he had been when he came through her door. He burned the inedible hair in the fireplace and wrapped the bones up in a napkin that he hid away under the bed in a wooden chest in which he found a clean pair of sheets. These he carefully put on the bed instead of the telltale stained ones he stowed away in the laundry basket. He plumped up the pillows and shook out the patchwork quilt. He picked up the Bible from the floor, closed it and laid it on the table. All was it as it had been before, except that grandmother was gone. The sticks twitched in the grate, the clock ticked, and the young man sat patiently, deceitfully, beside the bed in Granny's nightcap. Rat-a-tat-tat. Who's there? He quavers in Granny's antique falsetto. Only your granddaughter. So she came in, bringing with her a flurry of snow that melted into tears on the tiles, and perhaps she was a little disappointed to see only her grandmother sitting beside the tree. But then he flung off the blanket and sprang to the floor, pressing his back against the door so that she could not get out again. The girl looked round the room and saw that there was not even an indentation of a head on the smooth cheek of the pillow, and how for the first time she'd seen it so, the Bible lay closed on the table. The tick of the clock cracked like a whip, she wanted her knife from the basket, but she did not dare reach for it because his eyes were fixed upon her, huge eyes that now seemed to shine 
with a unique interior light, eyes the size of saucers, saucers full of Greek fire, diabolic phosphorescence. What big eyes you have, all the better to see you with. No trace at all of the old woman except for a tuft of white hair that had caught in the bark of an unburned log. When the girl saw that, she knew she was in danger of death. Where is my grandmother? There's nobody here but we two now, my darling. Now a great howling rose up all around them. Near, very near, as close to the kitchen garden, the howling of a multitude of wolves. She knew the worst wolves are hairy on the inside and she shivered in spite of the scarlet shawl she pulled more closely around herself, as if it could protect her, although it was red as the blood she must spill. Who has come to sing us carols, she said. Those are the voices of my brothers, darling. I love the company of wolves. Look out of the window and you'll see them. Snow half caked the lattice, and she opened it to look into the garden. It was a white night of moon and snow, the blizzard whirled round the gaunt grey beasts who squatted on their haunches among the rows of winter cabbage, pointing their sharp snouts to the moon and howling as if their hearts would break. Ten wolves, twenty wolves, so many wolves she could not count them, howling in concert as if demented or deranged. Their eyes reflected the light from the kitchen and shone like a hundred candles. It is very cold, poor things, she said. No wonder they howl so. She closed the window on the wolves' threnody and took off the scarlet shawl, the colour of poppies, the colour of sacrifices, the colour of her menses, and since her fear did her no good, she ceased to be afraid. What shall I do with my shawl? Throw it on the fire, dear one. You won't need it again. She bundled up her shawl and threw it on the blaze, which instantly consumed it. Then she drew her blouse over her head. Her small breasts gleamed as the snow had invaded this room. What shall I do with my blouse? Into the fire with it too, my pet. The thin muslin went flaring up the chimney like a magic bird, and now off came her skirt, her woolen stockings, her shoes, and onto the fire they went too, and were gone for good. The firelight shone through the edges of her skin, now she was clothed only in her untouched integument of flesh. This dazzling, naked, she combed her hair with her fingers. Her hair looked white as the snow outside. Then went directly to the man with red eyes and whose unkempt mane the lice moved. She stood up on tiptoe and unbuttoned the collar of his shirt. What big arms you have. All the better to hug you with. Every wolf in the world now howled as a prothalmion outside the window as she freely gave him the kiss she owed him. What big teeth you have! She saw how his jaw began to slather, and the room was full of her clamour of the forest liebstrod, but the wise child never flinched, even when he answered, All the better to eat you with. The girl burst out laughing. She knew she was nobody's meat. She laughed at him full in the face. She ripped off his shirt for him and flung it into the fire in the fiery wake of her own discarded clothing. The flames danced like dead souls on one Pergus night, and the old bones under the bed set up a terrible clattering. But she did not pay them any heed. Carnivore incarnate, only immaculate flesh appeases him. She will lay his fearful head on her lap, and she will pick out the lice from his pelt, and perhaps she will put the lice into her mouth and eat them, as he will bid her, as she would do in a savage marriage ceremony. The blizzard will lie down. The blizzard will die down. The blizzard died down, leaving the mountains as randomly covered with snow as if a blind woman had thrown a sheet over them, the upper branches of the forest pines lined, creaking, swollen with the fall. Snow light, moonlight, a confusion of paw prints, all silent, all still. Midnight, a clock strikes, it is Christmas Day, the werewolf's birthday. The door of the solstice stands wide open, let them all sink through. See, sweet and sound, she sleeps in Granny's bed. 
between the paws of the tender wolf. Good night.